Dr. Herning did such a good job of sharing uh, some personal perspectives. I've worked with older adults for over 40 years. Uh, I actually started but only two years into the profession, immediately converted to geriatrics and started in acute care and rehabilitation. Then I was in skilled care facilities, nursing homes, both direct services and consulting for 10 years of my career. I uh, have worked also in home health care and more recently most of my work has been in the community and particularly focused on health promotion with older adults. Okay, so, well, I missed the last one there. Um, applying holistic approaches fit the individual, I think, is so important um, because we, these, at least we believe that they put people at less risk for injury and allow them full participation in the activities that are meaningful to them. So now Dr. Morley covered a lot about the incidence and the etiology of falls and injuries in older adults. But I think as a reminder, we see that falls are a very frequent occurrence in older adults, that one out of three, age 65 and older, and I'm in that category. Um, so I'm personally very cognizant. Uh, we know that injury death is a frequent outcome of falls. And we know that in the year 2007, and this is data from our Center for Disease Control, that over 18,000 older adults died from unintentional fall injuries. And he provided to you also some specific data related to falls in nursing homes. Definitely, these injuries affect the individual's quality of life. Uh, Dr. Morley also mentioned the fear of falling that often uh, really is so intimidating, falls are so intimidating to some older adults that they choose not to participate. Um, we know from the literature and, um, and the, this citation is also from the Center for Disease Control that there are a number of modifiable fall risk factors muscle weakness, which Dr. Herning really addressed extensively, as well as the gait and balance problems. Poor vision has been mentioned by Dr. Morley, and I will spend some more time on that. Polypharmacy, I think you've heard a bit about how medications and their side effects can contribute, as well as environmental hazards. So these have been found to be, all of these, absolutely contributing to fall risk um, and, you know, highly detrimental. <coughs> then we also know that, especially in facilities, uh, that there's an increased staff burden whenever you've got falls. Uh, we know, of course, the increased paperwork, and even if we're moving into e-technology for documentation, uh, there's more documentation no matter what kind you have. Certainly increased care results for residents uh, or, or any patients who fall. Um, poor survey results <laughs> occur. Uh, lawsuits, of course, are uh, a risk. <coughs> Higher insurance premiums and staff morale. Of course, none of us wants to see individuals fall and injure themselves. Now I'm going to shift a bit and talk about, uh, for many of you this may be a review, but how occupational therapy views uh, the human <laughs> and uh, what we're about and what we do. So we have this model that focuses on the person and their intrinsic factors, their environment, which includes uh, the natural environment, the built environment, certainly their social and culture, cultural environment, and their economic support. 
Um, we look at what they do, which we call occupational performance, and to what extent do they participate. So we kind of dissect all of that. Our assessments tend to encompass those various factors, and uh, that's how we view um, how we can assist this older adult. To, so specifically, within the realm of the person, who is this person today and who have they been? What is their past life? Also, what is their history of faults? Um, because who they are today and who they've been, uh, much of their identity, of course, revolves around that. And also their interest in participating in whatever activities may have a lot to do with who they are and whether they are at risk for, for falls or other injuries. Also, what do they want to do? What are their priorities? And it's also about what do they need to do and what is expected of them. So those are other components. Then the environment I mentioned uh, on the last slide, what is the context of this older adult? because that can certainly have a bearing on risk factors. And then in terms of our OT intervention, of course, in terms of falls, we look at how we can assist the person to perform the activities that they need and want to do, but will also prevent falls. Um, and of course, this is all about supporting their quality of life, minimizing the kind of care that they're going to need or currently need, and the, the burden to staff or other caregivers who may be in the home, family members as well. All right, so now some of the resources that have been used for um, especially environmental assessment, um, perhaps some of you, all of you may be familiar with these. There's one, these are all developed here in the United States, uh, the Safe at Home, which is a, a very quick home safety assessment. It has about 72 items to it. It's a very good home-based uh, review of, of environmental factors and uh, what might be, you know, what kind of modifications might be indicated. Uh, and then the, the SAFER, which is the Safety Assessment of Function and the Environment for Rehabilitation, uh, was developed in the 90s. And it's also, um, it was developed in 1993, and then it, it has uh, pretty strong reliability and validity um, supports uh, for its use. So those are some developed in this country. And then these have all been developed um, primarily in Australia, but actually they're also um, really quite good tools. Uh, when I've used some of them, especially the Westmead, there are a few minor, very minor cultural differences. Uh, so maybe the terminology isn't quite the same for something like a gate if you're dealing with somebody you're seeing in, you know, in their home. But um, otherwise, it's really very good, very detailed. Um, and it, it has very strong reliability and validity statistics as well. Um, I haven't spent as much time using the home fast or the this this S O Y F W A home safety checklist, but they're all, both also very useful tools. Um, interestingly, and Dr. Herning made quite a point of outcome studies, we need a lot more information on um, how the environment impacts or, uh, let's say, precipitates falls and injuries. There are not that many studies that have been done about that. So I know when working with our students on applied research 
I tell them we need a lot more studies and you know people out in the field as you are can be contributors to their, those studies. If you are interested in being involved uh, I would encourage you to get in contact with somebody at a, the, either that you know or a nearby college or university and inquire because we have to rely on sometimes a lot of local data collectors for, um, for studies. So now to turn to the intrinsic factors that contribute to falls and other injuries. Uh, the normal age-related changes that occur we know are physiological, cognitive, spiritual, neurobehavioral, and psychological. And especially the neurobehavioral aspect is kind of an emerging area of science. So I think we're going to learn a lot more about how um, neuro, neurological function is, gets translated into behavior. And in our field, we call it neurooccupation, sort of the end product of that interface of uh, the central nervous system and what it is that we do. But we know that those normal age-related changes have all of our systems, of course, moving in decremental um, changes toward lesser function. And then, of course, we have these specific um, other intrinsic factors, vision, where we have changes in the lens of the eye, um, the, the, and the, the um, lens of the eye becomes more opaque and yellows over time, and so you have decreased ability to see a full spectrum of colors the same way as we're long, younger. The retina uh, requires much more light. We know that for people who are 80, they require as much as three times more than a 20-year-old in terms of light. And so anytime I walk into an environment that is darker, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how is this person, if they're older, going to function? Or theaters or restaurants, and I myself, uh, I've noticed changes over time. So I always carry a little pen line with me um, because you never know when you might need that. Um, hearing changes are pretty evident to most of us. Um, our sense of smell, which is often why uh, the older adult thinks the food, uh, especially in, in long-term care, is is really not so hot. Well, it may not be that. You know, it, it might be a combination of sensory change in taste and smell. Um, and of course, we hope that the food that we served is is reasonably good. Um, cognition. We know that uh, there are those changes. We know that processing of information is slower as we age, but we actually get better in problem solving. Why do you think that is? Anybody? Why can we problem solve better? Because we, we need to change, they need to change what they're doing in order to actually do it. You know, they, if they're compensating, they can't get out of a chair, they've got a problem level, but how do I get out of this chair? And that's when they start changing their body mechanics in order to get up. Take the time more wisdom. Okay. Well, I think all of those things contribute absolutely the wisdom. You've had so much experience doing things that problem solving, you know, I, I use this analogy with the files in a computer. We've got more files to draw from, <laughs> so more resources in terms of problem-solving um, abilities. Um, so we've had an excellent discussion of balance and coordination. We know that all of the internal systems change. Joints, muscles, posture, and strength have also been addressed. And um, then we also know that acute medical conditions are often um, more frequent. Most people have some forms of chronic conditions. Um, 
may, perhaps deterioration simply from the lack of activity. You know, the sedentary lifestyles that we keep hearing about. And uh, of course, Dr. Morley made a major point about no bed rest. <laughs> Um, and I think that, you know, lack of activity is what is, is truly a barrier for a lot of older adults in terms of maintaining their strength and uh, coordination, posture, energy levels. Um, unsafe behaviors and symptoms. Um, you know, we know that in our older adults that some studies have shown that up to two-thirds may have a form of clinical depression. So I have this picture here sort of depicting, you know, this person may be depressed, becomes alcoholic as a result or some other kind of substance abuse. Um, and then do you know that um, the highest incidence of AIDS in this country currently is in a population of people who are age 60 and over. And it's just a matter of lack of knowledge, I think, and um, you know, just not being informed. So there are some unsafe behaviors and related symptoms. And of course, quite a point was made by Dr. Morley about medication side effects. So now I'd like to turn to environmental factors that can contribute to falls and other injuries, and we call those extrinsic factors. So the typical age-related changes that occur are in social support. Um, we know that as families grow, um, adult children may move away or not. You know, you may have a very close uh, family unit yet. Um, some families are very much intact and others are at great distances. Actually, all of my adult children live hours away from me and one lives a half, halfway around the world. So, you know, it's, you're not going to always have immediate social support. Um, both the social and economic systems, um, so their financial status, even their, uh, you know, the, the whole uh, topic of health care reform, um, pensions, uh, the, the recession we've been going through, um, all of those kinds of factors contribute as they're part of the environment. Culture and values. Uh, what has been this person's style of living? Uh, what are their basic values? Are they from kind of a mainstream culture in the U.S.? Are they from somewhere else originally? Or maybe a very unique culture within the states that's been here, you know, practically forever. But that is, is very important. The built environment, what kind of physical environment are they living in, are they accustomed to, and do they really enjoy? And then, of course, the natural environment. Uh, just a quick story about the natural environment. Um, my husband and I were visiting with a, a couple just a couple of nights ago, and they had um, I guess they have a getaway place in Colorado that's in at 11,000 feet. Well, they invited their whole family to come, but they couldn't, and over the time, they realized they couldn't keep the place because everyone had elevation sickness, and especially the older parent absolutely could not tolerate 11,000 feet, you know oxygen deprivation, so they had to take her down the mountain and do something, you know, to, to deal with that. But I include these pictures because we have such a wide variety of, of um, possibilities that people either are currently living in or have come from and really value. Um, this one is, is pretty upscale, upper middle class, probably typical. Um, this one here, have you heard of the urban homestead movement? Well, anyway, 
I found this in the, the urban homestead, but people who love growing things and um, so forth often surround their place with all kinds of planting. So I thought that was pretty interesting. But also another part of this are our highway roads and streets. I know that we were following directions to come here this morning and I was so pleased that the directions were so clear. But, you know, you start making all these turns. If you're not familiar with the place, you start turning. You, you make a, what, you, you use the exit, then you turn left, and then you're to look for one, two, or three different other turns. Well, what about the signage? <laughs> the signage isn't always very clear. And our older adults, whose cognition may be slowed down, or their vision may not be quite as good, all of these things then present certain kinds of barriers. So I always look at the whole environment. And uh, one of the things that I've marveled at over the years is how Lambert International Airport, when you're trying to <laughs> access the airport, you have to make all these quick decisions. And every time I've done that, I've thought, what about that older person who's slower, who's still trying to function, is capable of driving, isn't a danger on the road, but still, you have to do all these things. So I think I challenge everyone here to please go back, if you're in a residential setting, Look at your environment and look at the approach. You know, how user-friendly is it for our older adults? For people who are in home care or other similar instances, it's the same kind of thing. We can look at all of these and say, how easy is it for our elders to navigate? What about landscaping? Um, so up here we've got, it's very clear where the sidewalk is, uh, the, where the entrance is. Here, not so clear with all these plantings. Uh, they may be wonderfully productive, but what about the person with um, ambulatory challenges? Here's a pretty hefty looking curb. This looks like steps with a railing, but if you've got vision problems and so forth, it may not be that easy to navigate. Um, so that's sidewalks and steps, building entrances, any building entrance. One thing here that I find fascinating is how we have so many doors that are so heavy. If you, I see some of you have noticed that too. I notice that some of the doors I encounter, and I think of myself as reasonably strong for my age, you know, I'm not a bodybuilder, but um, still, but my gosh, to push or pull, um, many of these doors are just so challenging for people. Okay, and then the interior, um, the lighting, the flooring, and I'm going to show examples and pictures, the choice of colors, our hallways and our stairways, which have mentioned, been mentioned before. Okay, also the entrance to the individual's room or apartment, whatever that might be. If somebody's carrying um, packages or bags of groceries or whatever the case is, is there any place near that entrance for them to set the, the things down so that they can then insert their key in the lock? kind of thing. Or are they still juggling or do they have to put it down and um, then try to get their key into the lock and then pick them up again. Um, the design of the room is certainly another factor in functionality and of course the type of furniture. So some of the safety considerations you know, we would really like to see railings on both sides of stairways. They don't always uh, happen, but especially if you've got people who've had strokes uh, and they need the, a railing, then certainly both sides would be indicated, it would seem. Um, 
doors. I've, I've mentioned some of that. Uh, making sure also that the doorways are wide enough. Uh, in institutions, this isn't, you know, you, you have codes and standards that you have to comply with. In homes, however, I mean, I've worked with people who had to go into their bathroom sideways with their walker because their doorway wasn't wide enough for the walker. So we look at all of those uh, and see if there are any modifications that could be recommended without enormous cost. Cabinets. Um, are cabinets reachable for the individual? And this, you know, this applies to any setting, whether it's the home or it's the nursing home. Um, what about reach? Because when a person is reaching, and you just had the functional reach test mentioned, if they're overreaching, of course, that's putting them at risk for a potential fall. Um, also, if they have things tucked away in the back and they have no way of accessing them, that's yet another risk factor. The pull-out shelves and drawers are much more functional for individuals if they can be afforded. Um, appliances, again, the, the notion of reach. Are the controls for appliances both easy to reach and easy to read because you can have mis errors made in terms of judgment uh, if someone misinterprets, uh, let's say, a control. They think it's on low and it's really on high. So I always think of beyond faults. Let's think about any injuries, you know, kind of thing. Um, fire and carbon <laughs> detectors. That, that issue is, is probably more of a home care kind of um, thought. But I have been in home environments where the air quality was so poor that after one hour of assessment and my initial interview with the person and, and developing a plan of care, I left with a headache. And I think we have to think broadly about the environment. In nursing homes, of course, you're very accountable. But when we're dealing with people in other environments, we should take in, you know, what are all the factors impacting their function? If it gives me a headache, at the time this happened, I was um, in my mid-40s and I'm 20 years older. What is it doing for that older adult? You know, is it affecting them, putting them at additional risk for falls or other injuries? Uh, the toxic substances, uh, especially, you know, they can spill. If somebody leaves something out and open, um, you know, it could be a gas can in a garage. Sometimes people store things there. Or down in a basement level where you've got a puddle of something on the floor. It might be toxic or not, but it could be a slip, a false slip hazard.